you do that? Hold on. And we witness the birth of a new chapter in Doctor Who history. She's my daughter. It's a story about becoming a dad. What do you think? Dad? Brilliant! You're brilliant! So join Confidential and find out who really is the daddy. Careful, there might be traps! What is quite possibly the coolest storyline ever? I'll have to manage on my own. Jerry! Watch and learn, Father. Today, the Doctor Who cast and crew are all set for a new arrival. Arm yourself. Where did she come from? From me. From you? How? Who is she? She's my daughter. Hello, Dad. Big story. Big story for the Doctor. I just said the title is The Doctor's Daughter. But lo and behold, Jenny, who is his daughter, uh, steps out of the machine. And out of this machine, I step because I have been made out of his DNA, so I am his daughter. Look at his annoyed lightning. It's kind of very deliberate. I think it's one of the best um, pre title sequences we've ever had. Hello, Dad. Lovely. And, um, oh, I think that's, that's great, that's Georgia. Amazing. I think it's lovely. And I love the smile. It's really great. OK, let's Thank go then, you. please, one more. The phone call from uh, Russell and Julian Phil basically said, the doctor's daughter. And then they all went, shh. <laughs> so it's going to be a big secret. Penning the doctor's unplanned parentage was far from inconceivable. But it is a script that leaves the unwitting father to be somewhat baffled. Why would the TARDIS bring us here? Donna, the Doctor and Martha find themselves in an out-of-control TARDIS. So they can't tell where it's taking them. And, in fact, when it lands, they don't know where they are. Oh, I love this bit. I thought you wanted to go home. I know, but all the same. Is that a feeling you get? Like swallow the hamster. There's these two colonies at war. Don't move, stay where you are. Stop your weapons. We're not armed. Look, no weapons, never any weapons. We're safe. And society has started to break down. Wait! Oi! What's wrong with having clean hands? What's going on? Leave him alone! The two races have a way of replicating themselves um, to create more soldiers for their army. Ah! Ah! And, and that is to, to progenate them, which means, you know, a tissue sample is taken from a person yeah. and a new, a new person is grown. Are you all right? First of all, you get a Doctor who just wants nothing to do with her, just like, you know, the CSA would be chasing him across the galaxy. Not mine, technically mine, but not my responsibility in any way, shape or form. Generated. Well, what about that? Jenny. Jenny. Yeah, I like that. Jenny. I don't think the Doctor accepts that she is his child at first. Just because I share certain physiological traits with simian primates doesn't make me a monkey's uncle, does it? I'm not a monkey! A further complication to the, to the kind of Doctor's relationship with his new daughter is that she is a warrior. Every child of the machine is born with this knowledge. It's our inheritance. It's all we know. How to fight and how to die. She's born to fight. She's born to use weapons. She's born to, to, to karate chop and kick her feet. Oh, so the Doctor's daughter fires her way onto our screens and into Doctor Who history. She kind of comes out as a canal. Kind of manufactured soldier with a kind of pre-programming towards aggression and war. Instant mental download of all strategic and military protocols. Our generation 5,000 soldier primed and peak physical health. Oh, I'm ready. I think 
think she's quite like a newborn child. Hello, Dad. She has the skills to be able to fight. And she knows that that's what she should be doing. She's working on instinct a lot of the time. So her instinct is quite bullshit, it's quite kind of in your face, it's quite cheeky. Hello, boys. She's a soldier who finds every single rule of her life being challenged without ever actually backing down. Why did you do that? They were trying to kill us. But they've got my friend. Collateral damage. She's one of the few people who can properly defend a soldier's viewpoint to the doctor. You keep insisting you're not a soldier, but look at you, drawing up strategies like a proper general. No, no, I'm trying to stop the fighting. Isn't every soldier? And she shuts him up. She actually makes him speechless once or twice, which Donna loves. Donna, will you tell her? Oh, you are speechless. I'm loving this. You keep on, Jenny. The episode is a journey of her learning how to use those skills in the right way, because at the beginning, she's, she's completely let loose. She has no boundaries. <laughs> Time to run again. Love the running. So what does it take to turn actress Georgia Moffat into G.I. Jenny? So when you fire... Uh, ...does that, all right? If I pass you the gun now... ...so... ...that's it, then come through there... And ...there you go, come see. Today I'm doing loading of guns and then afterwards lots of firing of them, which is great because I would have ever thought I'd get to hold a gun in my entire career. Rather than using real guns with uh, with um, blank ammunition, this is uh, we've actually got a gas firing gun. We can fire this all day long, um, as many times as you want. So there'll be uh, a lot more gunfire in this particular episode. Okay, thank you. Here we go then, and action, and open fire. Shots are coming back at you. Fight! Let's yes! Come on! I have no idea what they are, I think they're machine guns, but they're awesome, and I want one. And then sky, sky your weapons. So you like, bang, 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 It's always that responsibility for the fact that what you were messing with and, and constructing was this kind of canonicity, this backstory of the Doctor, which you don't often get to kind of tangle with. What up that time, Lords? Dead. And also <clears throat> an awareness of the fact that, that you were starting to open up in the story aspects of the Doctor's past life that we don't often get to discuss about his, his uh, previous uh, family that he had and lost in the, in the Time Wars. My entire planet died. My whole family. Do you think it never occurred to me to go back and save them? In the current series, once or twice we've had fleeting little mentions, he said to Rose in the TARDIS and fear her that he'd been a father once. Easy for you to say. You don't have kids. I was a dad once. What did she say? I think we're there. And now, obviously, this story, um, it's, it's not a natural biological daughter, you could argue, but uh, this, this really brings him face to face with fatherhood. Don, I've been a father before. What? Lost all that a long time ago. Along with everything else. I'm sorry. I didn't know. He's going to have a, a, a mixture of complicated emotions uh, when another member of that race or something closely akin to it, pops out of a machine. Um, and I think that's an interesting, emotional, dramatic place for the character to go. You know, it, it came out of also a desire to keep pushing David and to keep taking him in new directions and, and keep challenging him, really. 
What do you call a female Time Lord? What's a Time Lord? That's who I am. That's where I'm from. To suddenly find himself with a member of family is, is kind of one of the biggest challenges you could give him. So I'm chuffed we did it. If you knew my story, word for word, had a Another memorable meeting came back in 2007, where David came face to face with his doctor. Shabby looking thing. <laughs> We were racking our brains about what we would do for children in need. And Russell said, well, why don't we just maybe do a two doctors? Like <laughs> uh, last year for Children in Need, we did Time Crash, written by Stephen Moffat, which had David Tennant meeting Peter Davison in a, in a brand new little sort of ten minute scene on board the TARDIS, which was just delightful to work on. Sorry. What? 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 Julie phoned me up. She said that uh, you know, there could going to be an eight-minute uh, children in need special for Doctor Who. I could do anything I liked as long as it was shootable in one day and involve one set and no CGI, which is obviously a limitless panorama to involve yourself in. And action. Who are you? Oh, brilliant. I mean, totally wrong, big emergency, universe goes bang in five minutes, but... Brilliant. I'm the Doctor, who are you? I phoned up Peter, and he was well up for it, which I kind of knew he would be, because he's a big fan of the new series, and his kids are big fans of the new series, and uh, I think he's desperate to qualify for his own top Trump's card. A bit saggier than it ought to be. Here's a bit greyer. Ah, that's because of me, though. Two of us together, it shorted out the time differential. We should all snap back in place when we get you home. It was uh, very strange to be uh, coming back into Doctor Who. I, I'd, I'd been asked a few months before by Stephen Moffat if I'd be interested in doing it, and I leapt to the, the chance just because, you know, I'm a great fan of the, the new series. But never mind that, look at you! The hat, the coat, the crickety cricket stuff, the stick of celery, yeah. Brave choice, celery, but fair play to you. Not a lot of men can carry off a decorative vegetable. Shut up! It's almost eye twisting to see the, uh, the two of them together on the set. Who are you? Take a look. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, yes. You're... Oh, no. Here You're... it comes. Yeah, yeah, I am. A fan. Yeah. But standing in that outfit on the new set, I did feel slightly out of place. And it took me a little time to feel at home there. Um, but once we got into it, I, I, I sort of... I got quite into it. What? Level 10, now. This is bad. Two minutes to Belgium. What do you mean a fan? I'm not just a fan, I'm you. OK, you're my biggest fan. Look, it's perfectly understandable. I go zooming around space and time, saving planets, fighting monsters and being, well, let's be honest, pretty sort of marvellous. Although he looks older, he still looks like the Doctor. He still looks like him, you know? Not, not everyone in their 50s looks like uh, they did in their late 20s, but he, he does. He still looks like the same man. The cluster bell. Yeah, right on time, that's my cue. In less than a minute, we're going to detonate a black hole strong enough to slow the entire universe! It was just terrific to do. What can I say? Thank, Thank you. you. Doctor. Thank you. I'm very, very welcome. And cut. Thank you. When he finished his episode with David for Children in Need, he rang me up and he said, Right, now it's your go. Peter Davison is George's dad. There is a... The, clearly, a very strong Doctor Who link there. Keep quiet and open the door. And he unlocks the door. Uh, the Doctor, Donna and Jenny are creeping under cover through the camera. She rang me up, I remember her saying, she, she, can I just tell you my first line? I said, yeah, go on then. It's, hello, Dad. <laughs> hello, Dad. The first line was, hello, Dad. And I was like, oh, my God. I thought, well, that's a good start, you know, I mean... <laughs> I went to school with the daughter of Colin Baker as well, and her dad was Doctor Who, so I was sort of under the impression that everyone's dad was Doctor Who. Oh, don't! <laughs> it wouldn't have been interesting for the doctor to suddenly kind of welcome her with open arms. I wanted him to have a really quite aggressive reaction against her. Why did you do that? They were trying to kill us. But they've got my friend. Collateral damage. It's awful for him in that this daughter is everything he wouldn't be. She's a soldier. She's got military protocols downloaded into her brain. She can fight, and she wants to fight. That's the important thing. And she thinks killing is fine. 
On set, it's up to the special effects team to start this relationship off with a big bang. Oh, I like this here. Here. And this one. So this is the, the very beginning of the episode, uh, when obviously the, the humans have set the, the charges, uh, they're running away, um, and uh, the half are coming. So, what's happening is, set the charges, go blow up the tunnel. But you, you're going to light up, yeah? Yeah. Uh, light up, light up, light up. I'm just testing for myself to make sure I know how the, the fireball's going to behave. Um, plus, I'm also working out the timing because I've got two elements to this particular effect, one of which is the big fireball, and also there's going to be a pyro charge, which is a, a, a shifting charge. It's going to throw some debris. So basically, I want to create a blanket which will mask the fact that, um, you know, so the whole ceiling's come down. OK, all lit and clear? Testing. Three, two, one. A really nice fireball, which obviously fill, fills this whole tunnel, um, and then obviously the pyro in, uh, included in that as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it's it's, it's going to look pretty pretty special to hopefully. You know, yeah. The cast and crew prepare to feel the full force of Danny's explosion. There's always a great deal of tension in the air when we ha when we have to do a, a big explosion scene. quite exciting when you know when they clear the set and and and, and we realize oh god this really is quite a big deal because we were the only you know they just literally locked the camera off and, and everyone else left okay here we go half speed action Martha develops a bond with the half that she helps heal, Peck, he's called. Um, he had a dislocated uh, shoulder, so she pops that back in and, and it, they become very good friends. It's okay, you can feel your shoulder. No, okay. They've just kidnapped me and brought me here, and it's like. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he has kidnapped you. And the only reason why you're going over to him is because he's groaning uh, in a really yeah. little kind of like. Hello. Is it your arm? Yeah. You know, he's half fish, half humanoid, and what, is this a shoulder? Is it? I don't know. It might be dislocated. So she doesn't really know. Just keep still. Still, yeah. No move. We had a paramedic on set that was advising us how a shoulder pops in. So I'm sure, you know, a shoulder is a shoulder, maybe. Three. <laughs> I think Martha's side of this adventure is a very sweet one. She, see, she lets us into a world that otherwise we wouldn't see, and she shows us the other side of the battle. Now then, I'm Dr Martha Jones. Who the hell are you? Kind of came out of the fact that we simply couldn't contain Martha, Donna, the Doctor and Jenny within the one storyline. We tell their story through her. She becomes the person who uses her empathy to understand them and therefore we do. <laughs> She accepts the Hath for what they are. She, you know, she isn't scared of them. Then it almost probably does remind her of the nice aspects of, of time travel. <laughs> it's up to you, but nothing's going to stop me. Time travel's not all plain sailing. Sometimes you end up in deep water. Our 
after being blasted and freezing, then I went into um, into some quicksand. <laughs> Being in that in that water essentially um, was fine. I had a wetsuit on underneath all of my clothes. It's minus five, and the cast and crew are braving the elements. So once at the initial splash, and I'm a little bit low, then I can actually go to get up, and then realise that the sinking starts. Okay, cool. <laughs> They were warriors who looked like they were going to kill her and then gradually unraveled that actually they're quite nice, they're quite gentle creatures, quite funny, and actually end, they end up saving her life rather than kind of killing her. To actually, you know, play the scene, it, it was just so sad, I think, for Martha and for me doing it because he was such a sweet character. <laughs> Save me! I won't let you die! <laughs> what are you doing? Helping you! It's a brilliant moment for Martha. I think you see her humanity and you see the pain that she feels, really, and why she can't personally keep travelling with the doctor, because she sees that pain. I'm so sorry. Goodbye, friend. So it was really, really sad that after she, Martha, had, you know, <laughs> offered him to, to, to come on this adventure and, and you know, broaden his horizons, that he ends up... <laughs> losing his life, which sort of directly is her fault, really. And I think that, for me, playing the scene, it was sad anyway, just because... ..cos it was just a miserable night altogether. <laughs> there was an outbreak of pacifism in narrations back before we lost contact. Is that where you came from? Eastern Zone, that's us, yeah. Yeah, I'm the Doctor, this is Donna. The Doctor uh, has, has his own um, drawer full of double standards when it comes to... Uh, behaving as a soldier. Something that he clearly has done. And done on quite an epic scale. For the planet. For the planet. Let's do it. There is no such thing as a pacifist in, in a real universe, I think. Let me out of these manacles, you'll find out how much fun I am. He will eventually turn to violence if there's no other option. Sometimes you have to fight, you have to... It, it, if it's simple, a simple surrender uh, is not enough. Everything has its time and everything dies. But he doesn't do it lightly, and he doesn't do it with any joy. He will only do it for the greater good. Defense part Delta, come on! There's always been a battle in the programme, in the scripts, when we talk about it as, as to how far the Doctor will go, how involved he is and, and what cost there is for the things he does. Empress of the Rachnos, I give you one last chance. You've got a man who, when he fought the Empress of the Rachnos, when he'd lost Rose, was absolutely bleak and desolate and was committing genocide. There's always something interesting and contradictory at the heart of the Doctor about his, his anti-violent message, but at the same time his 
passionate commitment to fight for things that he believes in. There's a great warrior inside there. He might hide it under that smile and the charm and the suit and the good looks and everything. Actually, there is one hell of a battler inside him who won an awful lot of fights and is a good man to be on your side in a war. So it's a tricky area. like it, then it will stop. Fascinating. As I was writing this and began to look at the backstory stuff we could draw, and of course the realization that effectively he was a foot soldier in the Time Wars, and I you know and was at this the center of this, you know, what must have been, you know, a massive, uh, epic slaughter. And you fought and killed. Yes. It's fair enough that exposure to violence can make you uh, very abhorrent of violence. I think that makes sense. This pain, the killing. After a while, it infects you. And once it does, you're never rid of it. It's interesting when he's uh, confronting Jenny, I think, and challenging her on her predisposition towards being a warrior, that she has the, the gumption to front him up and say, well, I'm not doing anything that you weren't doing, even if it was 900 years ago. Oh, I know that look. See it a lot round our way. Blokes with push chairs and frowns. At first, he's very reluctant to to even acknowledge it, let alone accept that that this is his daughter. You've got dad shock. Dad shock. Sudden, unexpected fatherhood. Take a bit of getting used to. Donna seems to adopt Jenny really quickly, and I think it's partly out of her own uh, sense of interest in, in, in what she does to the doctor. Jenny, that's the, the woman from the machine, the soldier. My daughter, except she isn't, she's, she's... Anyway, where are you? It's quite amazing, I think, how strongly Donna comes through in this episode. I think she really, she really finds her place here as that voice that brings the doctor back down to earth. What's she gonna do, cramp your style? Like, you've got a sports car, she's gonna turn it into a people carrier. She's the voice of, of reason in his head, I think. You belong here with them. She belongs with us, with you, she's your daughter. She's a soldier. She came out of that machine. Oh, yes, I know that bit. I think over the time she learns from the Doctor and Donna that actually the way that she's... the way that she kind of... she does fight and she doesn't control how she feels is not necessarily the right way of doing it. She learns morals over the time. So it's kind of a story of growth, I guess. That's it! Hurry up! Oh, no, 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 no! The circuit's moved back! The sequence where Jenny flips through the beams um, that are preventing them getting from one end of the corridor to the other um, was always in that script from, from the first draft, really. Stephen Greenhorn felt it very important in order to just be a very quick way of demonstrating, really, just how agile, how much of a warrior Jenny really was. She's not a clone of the Doctor. We're very careful to avoid the fact that she's not cloned, that she is her own person, but you can see the, the doctorishness in her. Watch and learn, Father. And you can see that actually that he, the, the reason he would warm to her is because he begins to recognise there are elements in her that, that, that are strong in him as well. No way! The logistics of filming that sequence really is careful planning. So if you come and just... It, it's going to slow down at the end of it. All right. So just, you, might, well, you want to be low where you were, I think, Carwell. Yeah, just a lot of coordination with the stunt um, coordinator and the actors, yeah. um, and taking it from there, really. He had to be storyboarded really carefully by Alice. He had, she really had to work out how Jenny should move through that path of light and how we could shoot that in the most economical way. Georgia did have to have some kind of training because obviously we did need to see her start the movement off and, you know, do that final roll and kick that she does. Georgia's an actress, she's not a gymnast. And um, whilst she's, you know, she's really fit and really, really game, we had to make her look like, you know, an Olympic gymnast of the highest order. Very quickly realised we were going to need a body double. So we had a body double who was a gymnast who does that fast back flipping. 
costume and makeup department have to had to make that lady look identical to Jenny. I mean, she's obviously not identical for Jenny, and the and the sequence moves so quickly that actually you blink and not know. Really, what I kind of want is if you do it once more here, and then I get you here. Whereas I otherwise, I'm going to have to cut somewhere between between the mood. Yeah. Yeah. Alice had a very specific way that she wanted it to look, and. Um, Every time she threw something at Belinda, she was able to just go, yep, this is fine, I'll just do that. <laughs> no pressure, man. <laughs> oh, God. And so it took, it took, I think we went through probably about five or six different routines before we hit on the last one. Action. All these special effects sequences are smoke and mirrors. They're all, they all involve an amount of um, kind of camera trickery. Um, but you can only do that so far, and actually, you need that shot of her starting and ending that action. I just, I, I'm automatically doing that with my hand. Start with them lower and use the momentum of pushing them up to start. Belinda made it look so effortless, the whole thing, and she did for literally two days, was just flipping down corridors like that. And you just think, ah, oh, it's incredible. You I think that you can like... go from a handstand into a forward roll, you know. I, I think before I'll we do start it, shooting. She's <laughs> But okay, I mean, what, all yeah. right, OK. We had about two days rehearsal on it. Um, and I, in the end, I think I did a cartwheel and a flip from a crab to standing up position. The rest of it I couldn't do because I, uh, we tried, we did try, but I, it didn't look very cool. It didn't look like it should. Well, I think that the, that the end sequence stands up brilliantly, actually. And it's as a result of that commitment. That was impossible. Not impossible. Just a bit unlikely. Brilliant! You were brilliant! Brilliant! By the end of it, they've both realised that they want to be a little bit more like the other one and admire that in each other. Action. With the relationship between the doctor and his daughter literally flipped on its head, the future seems blooming marvellous. Oh, yes. Isn't this brilliant? It was a fantastic location and perfect for this episode. Is that the salt? It's beautiful. What is it? Terraforming. It's a... Uh... Third generation terraforming device. I think it just gave us that uh, feeling of another, another dimension. Especially when you've had a whole episode that has been subterranean, when you've been in tunnels, you've been in darkness, it's been filled with war and violence and sort of claustrophobia, and then to come out into a, a beautiful, beautiful, green, lush, vibrant um, atmosphere um, is, is, is a whole part of the story's quest the whole part of the story's journey that they make i'm the doctor and i declare this war is over it's a recurring motif isn't it that as soon as the doctor looks like he's found somebody new to share his life with they've got to die or leave him what does that mean it means a new world <laughs> it's all it it just comes out of the blue no it's not expected Jenny, 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 talk to me, Jenny. If I should die this very moment, I wouldn't feel. For I've never known completeness like being here. Wrapped in the warmth of you, loving every breath of you. From the doctor's point of view, it's, it's, it's another tragedy, it's another disappointment, it's another heartbreak. Jenny, be strong now. You need to hold on, you hear me? We've got things to do, you and me.
We've only just got started. You're gonna be great. No, you're gonna be more than great. You're gonna be amazing. You hear me? But as soon as the doctor begins to accept her, that as soon as the doctor opens his heart to her, then she's got to get shot in one of hers. She's like me. If we wait, we just wait. There's no sign, Doctor. It was a really bizarre experience because it was definitely my favourite scene, and yet it was the hardest one to play. When you've got that person towering over you, looking devastated by this, it, 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 you can't help. But I never planned to cry in it. That wasn't a you know a decision I'd made beforehand. But that it just happened. The whole thing happened. I think the turning point of the scene, when the Doctor loses Jenny, we've seen him suffer loss before, uh, with Rose um, and with the Master. It's my last chance to sit here. <sighs> Rose Tyler. He's in a situation where, when he picks up the gun and points it at Cobb's head, that's quite unusual for him to even threaten. I never would. Towards the end, when the doctor does pick up a weapon, that was something that was kind of that that was discussed at some length because it was such a an extraordinary thing for his character to do. Have you got that? I never would. And now, at the end of this episode, it's like we see a man who was equally had a loss and is equally distraught, but is sort of somehow stronger. He's not quite in that. Even in that moment where he points the gun at Cobb's head, I don't think you could seriously argue that he's about to kill him. He's using this moment of anger to make a statement to the whole society around him. It's not just a hollow gesture, it's not just personal. Make the foundation of this society a man who never would! Endless moment of actually setting the foundation for the entire planet of Messaline. He's, he's an extraordinary man. You know, who, who else could do that? I just can't imagine. But. He takes the most personal moment and makes it into a statement of liberty, actually, and, 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 and a proper moral worth. So it's amazing. Hello, boys. Yeah, I, think, I think what's interesting is the fact that she's still there at the end of the show. Come back. Sorry, can't stop. What are you going to do? Tell my dad. I wonder if that will become important in Doctor Who history. And an awful lot of running to do. It does leave a lot of ends untied, doesn't it? We have a little bit of fabulousness going on here on BBC Three tonight. We have Madonna live at Radio One's Big Weekend at 9.15. Madonna, 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 Madonna. But up next, almost as glam, it's Jeremy Clarkson with Top Gear.